Well, it's about time. Uh, so, if you call the roll. All right. Uh, we have Ken Whitcomb. Yep, this. <laughs> have James Harrison. Yeah. Here. Here. Alan Hart. Here. Uh, Ray Dodson. Not yet. Mark Terry. Here. Uh, Todd Wolf. Somebody. Karen Ferrera. Here. Teresa King. Hi. And we have our new member, Martin Bolden, here. I'm here. Uh, everybody's met, met him yet. And then. There's Ken. Ken's on the screen. Oh, okay. Perfect. <laughs> Try to wave. I don't know. I didn't even see me. Uh, we oh, have right. Councilmember Mike Branstetter. Hello, oh, sir. We have Assistant Chief John Unford. Here. And then we have Assistant Fire Chief Scott Adams. And we have, oh, there she is. We have our youth council, Josephine Kaiser. Welcome. Good to see you. I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Has everyone had the <clears throat> opportunity to, to overview the minutes? If you have, I will listen to a motion. Uh, to be uh, one correction, I think, to it. Uh, That's to the agenda, not the minutes, right? In the minutes now. Uh, it states in the minutes that there are uh, the people that are on the Summer Fest Dump Tank Committee. Uh, my name doesn't appear there, but I got a bunch of emails that I guess I am on the committee. I said I would help out, so it's up to Alan, I guess, and to have my name added to that. Okay, that's fine. We can make that correction. I don't want to be left out. Are you planning to be a dumper or a dumpy? No. I can't get wet because I have to deal with parcel too. So. I just use them to stick in the Okay. Any other any other corrections? Um, okay. Do I hear a motion to approve? Move the motion is to accept the contract. Second. All in favor? We'll move. Okay. Okay. Uh, no members of the public go in and comment. Okay. Okay, then our speaker. Uh, question off. Well, good evening, Weston Ott, Public Works Engineering Services Manager. Can you hear me all right this evening? Uh, I'm working on it. Please. Okay. Let me know, Joanna, when you're ready. And again, I don't have a formal presentation. This is slated as a question and answer from the committee. I can hear him great, by the way. Just FYI. Still not from the sound though. But I think it's loud enough. Okay. Can you say something? Test. Say test. Yes. Can you can you hear me all right, Joanna? I can. Can everybody else? I'm right next to it though. I'm cheating. <laughs> I hear him. Not distinct. Yeah. Can you try to turn it? Do you have your volume all the way up by any chance? Yes, I do. Oh, do the other remote for this. 
Try that, Weston. How's that sound now? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if you're ready. So uh, I am ready. Good evening, and hope everybody's doing well. I'm I'm actually not on the sunny shores of uh, Mazatlan Beach. I'm in Oak Brook right now. Um, I thought this meeting was virtual, otherwise I could have stopped by the police station on my way home tonight. So, uh, but with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions on school zones, neighborhood trap control, uh, trap control devices that you may have. I, I've got a question. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. You are at a distance off. I'll turn the volume to max. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to the frog in my throat, but I'll, I'll speak louder. Uh, as far as the number of controls that you have, or at least the number of uh, different times that you have the lights set for in the school districts, how long do those lights run? They run from like 7 in the morning to 10 or 11 in the morning in different, across the city. Not them are standard enough. Correct. So we work with the school district um, and each school and each school is different. If I remember correctly, I don't have the, uh, the timing list in front of me, yet, but I could get that and forward it on to Joanna. Um, the, ele the high school goes first, then elementary and then middle school. And I can't remember if it's 30 or 45 minutes they run around the time of their arrival. So it's before and a little bit after. Um, and public works staff program that, and it, you're right, it does constantly change with early release dates and uh, different breaks um, that the kids have. So our staff is constantly busy. They actually have to go out to each school zone and program each one of the devices. Are they at all schools? Which, what? criteria do you use to decide which schools are? So as far as I know, um, all school zones that have arterial roads or classified as arterial um, have a flashing school zone light, if that's the question. Well, we're, we're also interested in cameras. Correct. So red light cameras are not under public works. That's under police. And so that would be um, Chief Zaro and uh, Kevin McClure would be best to answer those questions. But public works doesn't maintain the red light cameras, only the school zone flashing lights. And we work closely with Kevin McClure. If anything comes up with those lights, let's say they quit working. Uh, we give him a heads up so he knows if it's an enforcement area. Does it matter whether it's public or private school? Uh, that's a great question because we do have school zone lights off of 112th by Lake Louise. And there used to be, I believe, a school in that Lutheran church up there. Um, and then there's St. Francis Cabrini as well, that we used to have the radar feedback sign, but there's currently not school zone lights there. Was it funding or, or what that changed that? Because I live near Cabrini, so I noticed that it was there. Yeah, as far as I know, we've never had flashing lights that I can remember at St. Francis Cabrini, and I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Uh, mm -hmm. Lights are where they've been for the last, I've been with 
city 15 years, so they're still in the same locations for the last 15 years. The, the, the uh, actual mileage um, meter, that, is that ever going to come back? Uh, I, that question was garbled. I think the question was the radar feedback sign. I guess it's one yeah. of those. Yes. Yeah. Uh, currently, that's not slated to be put back in. Um, I'd have to follow up with the director. He made that determination. So I'm going to start taking some notes here and get that information for you. Because there's a lot of people that don't pay any attention at all to the speed element, you know, the 20 mile per hour speed. The, the radar signs are around Port Silicon Park. So they do exist in the city. Correct. That was as a result of the neighborhood traffic control program. Uh, there's a series of measures that start in phase one and phase two. A radar feedback sign is a phase two uh, element that was put in because they consistently saw uh, the speed above the 85th percentile on Elwood. Any more questions? I guess comment more along the lines of traveling through a lot of the school zones. I've noticed that I noticed the flashing light, so I reduced my speed down. However, uh, I see all age groups uh, that are going through these school zones, and I guess I see the lack of enforcement. Before you go to the bus, but I see a lot of enforcement out there actually because there's no nothing to, I guess, hold them accountable for their speed. So they just simply, I mean, literally, I, I, I mean, if I drove with my mouth open at some of the speeds I watched go through these school zones with light flashing, which is telling me schools out children are present and such. It's kind of uh, appalling, actually. I mean, Clover Park, what's the one off Silver Cone Boulevard, the uh, middle school over there, uh, Rockburn. Yeah, so I, I, and I just see people just saying, and so it's basically an uh, uh, epidemic of people not paying attention to the road, more to their phones, and not the speed signs and the flashing lights and all the signals that tell you what's the situation is where. So I don't really think it's an engineering you know, traffic issue, it's more of it is. Forcing that stuff up here. So that's just my take on it because driving through, I can see and I look at what kind of people are driving these cars too. And it's, it's all ages. So there's no one that's probably set up. Right. <clears throat> so Lockburn on Stilton Boulevard does have the automated um, photo enforcement, um, at least on West Bend. Yeah. Um, not on the north side. Um, and then the other part is, you know, we have to do manual enforcement. So an officer out running the radar. Uh, so, and unfortunately, right now, just with our staffing issue, the traffic jam is pretty decimated. It's down to two officers and a sergeant. So, that plays a part in it. That's the problem. Is the photo enforcement, particularly now, people are trying to not obey the law, uh, is that being effective? Is it still effective that people actually obey this citation? Yeah, um, I mean, it, it catches, you know, quite a few people, it keeps kind of busy, uh, they go to court, and uh, they can, the only way out of it is to file an affidavit that you weren't driving the vehicle at the, at the time, and so on, so most of them get, get processed through, and they're paying the fines. Um, there's a, if I recall correctly, there's, there's a state law the law act, there's a process we have to go through to get red light or school zone cameras you know, mm -hmm. in place. And uh, I'd have to do the research on, on that. And then it's a funding issue. Yeah. The, um, the, the red light cameras that we had in the state were our, they're our real rules that the state had put in that affect both kind of road, but also the configuration of the intersection is to be conducive to the red light enforcement. 
meets all the different criteria. And, and, and there are similar type rules around uh, camera enforcement of school zones. Uh, those rules just had some change in the recent legislative session that authorized relax them or, or made arrangements for the cities to be able to put stuff more photo enforcement in school zones uh, and some changes to red light uh, that that just happened and so there hasn't really been a good look or a decision to see what new areas in Lakewood might benefit from that to do that. Now, part of the new rules were that uh, the state said that uh, you can have these relaxed rules, you can put up more things, but that a bigger percentage of the fines have to go be paid to the state. Okay. You know, after you get your costs, then we want a bigger piece of what's left. Hmm. But for the city's concern, photo enforcement has never been a revenue stream. You know, we, we when Weston spoke about public works isn't really in charge of the lights and doing all of that, uh, that's because those lot cameras and things are but the cameras are, are there's a contractor that sets them up takes the photos process gets them over to the court we've got some folks that look at that to decide they the camera think this is a violation does it look like a violation and then it, it gets into the court system <laughs> um, out 85 percent is the last number that was given to the council of uh, photo enforcement citations are people just paid in my mail. Um, and one of the advantages of those or disadvantages is that uh, they, uh, because of the nature of how the, of that type of enforcement, it, it, it neither goes on your driving record nor does it get reported to insurance uh, companies. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I don't think we, uh, well, I guess I will say, I don't know whether we track if there are any people who get lots of, <laughs> uh, I, I think most people uh, get one and they, they pay it and you may get another one at some other time to do that. Um, so, and that's slightly different than the photo enforcement by an officer in a, in, in, uh, on patrol that actually has capability of doing photo enforcement. So we may be in a window of, uh, of possible expansion of, of that, uh, that actually I think that the Chief Zaro and the, and the municipal court are really kind of sort of taking a look about to what extent do we want to go through and, and, and do that. Uh, the biggest cost to doing that, since it's kind of a break even thing, would be expanding it to the point of where you need more staff in the court to, to be able to deal with it. And we're, our court also serves Stellicum and DuPont. Neither of those jurisdictions have any red light care. I, I personally like to see the school zone speed cameras in every school zone. Because I, I, like Mark, I, I see people going fairly fast past me. And so I come past the high school, they fly past. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether the lights are on or not. They're going to do the same thing. I understand what you're saying. We can't have a, a lack of officers. We can't have a physical presence there. But mm -hmm. I think we can have a system present there, especially if you want to go to 
discussing here for school zones specifically. Uh, I think if we grew per se onto more red lights intersections or special areas that tend to have a lot of speed, but focusing on the school zone, I would be fine. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think school zones have a heftier fine too. If there's if you're speeding in one, which brings a little more not so much revenue as it is accountability to the speaker because they're having to pay that additional fine, which I think also as a school zone may actually show up on the record too. Could be wrong no, there, but that would reflect on the record, which you would have to your insurance too. So there's all there's a there's a uh, an effect there that if they decide to speed in the school zone and, and, the, and the, I guess the overall goal of this obviously is to prevent an incident from ever occurring. Hopefully that's what we do is we prevent something, we prevent that speeder from getting in trouble and having a death. And I would just say that the, the schedule for what the fine is uh, for uh, <coughs> moving violation of the speeding is Set somewhat in the, in the range is established by the state, and then you have to establish a lower range of fines when the force can be used. So there is a there, there is yeah. a difference. And one of the other factors that goes in, and like I said, we're going to be looking at it, but most of them, some of the existing cameras that we have is our. One not directly, one not directly like drive. We have one that's set up a boulevard. Um, <laughs> school zones. Um, that uh, when you go to get the contractor to put the system up and run it, they're they, they, they looking to make sure there's going to be enough miscreants that they're going to catch that's going to make it worth their while to go through the cost of putting those in and of maintaining and running that, running that system. So, for instance, I would, would say that we, there, 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 there are some schools that we have that uh, while, while speeding near any school, Problem. Um, for some of them, there's not enough speed to, uh, to do that. And, and the best action the city can take is the, um, the yellow flashing lights and signage and then in the mind people with voluntary compliance. But I think we'll see over the next couple of years. Uh, View that will result in some greater number of photo enforcement sites for the city, given the, the legislation that we will open that up. But uh, deciding where that is, and, and, and recognize that I appreciate that all of you are the choir, but there are people who don't like photo enforcement. We got the original ones. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of debate, and, and it's fairly evenly split between the people that like this the safety enhancement and the people that don't like uh, the tickets. They, they don't like the automated version. They like to be able to talk to the officer, and they think they need to talk their way out of it. I don't know. Um, there is some back end work, uh, the council member mentioned. So, uh, one of our community service officers that works the front desk also has to look at every single violation that comes in that comes into the picture. He has to verify that the, the speed or the red light and the car and the plate and everything matches and so on, and process that and send it to the court. And then, of course, the court has to process that either send out the ticket in the mail or you know, have the hearing in court. Um, so, the more cameras, you know, mentioned here, the capacity issue with both of those um, technicians. Um, but as they become less restrictive, then we will um, we have a process with sort of works to look at you know, accident data and get speed. Um, to studies and find out where the hotspots are. And so we try to narrow that down and focus on those areas so we'll put in new cameras. Can I make a recommendation? Teresa has a question. Oh, sorry. Teresa? You have a question? You're on mute. 
I, yeah, I just muted myself when you said that I had a question. I was wondering uh, two things. Are there any speed, is the photo enforcement function functional if the lights aren't flashing or it's outside of the window for that school zone to be active? No, it's not. And that's one of the things that the CSO looks at is, is the light activated um, when, they, when the picture is taken. Okay. Could it be active all the time? I'm sure there's some there's something that I'm not thinking of. There must be a reason why we can't do that, but I, I think they're limited to the time when children are arriving or leaving school, which is why we do the flashing lights. Um, and so we're restricted to that time because otherwise then it's not the, the lower speed limit, it's the regular speed limit. Are there places that do that? where it's not for a school zone, where it is for a regular speed limit? Um, I don't know that we're allowed under Washington state law to do that. Okay. It's I'm just- two school zones and red light uh, infractions. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if some of them could be active, if that was a thing that we could do. Um, so that people took them more seriously, or maybe they're not taking them seriously because the times that they are going through them every day on their way to work are at the beginning of the, or the end of the windows. Uh, so they're not seeing kids outside. So they're not taking it seriously and following that lower speed limit. There's also some of the brass that are sent out the memo that it appears that the state is going to broaden when speed zone cameras can be used, such as streets that are subject to street racing and things like that. Is that not correct? Yeah, yeah, they, 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 new legislation that was this year did tweak rules uh, regarding speed and location and things that can be so it's it each of the cameras that we have now was put up after the look. And so where there are now other places that might get cameras that can be looked at, um, you know, that's what that that will take some some time. Um, number of I was wondering whether Ms. Kaiser had any thoughts about uh, how effective what we do now or what we might do regarding safety around schools. Yes, absolutely. So currently I'm in high school, so obviously I can't speak to all middle school and elementary schools, especially concerning that there are um, there are a lot more of those in the area, but um, I do know that uh, high, the three high schools within the Clover Park School District are the first ones to um, be operating early in the morning. And um, in particular, I go to Harrison Pret, which is just catty corner to Lockburn Middle School. And recently, a lot of construction um, was going on uh, on, I believe, it was Stillicum. Um, and that, I believe, greatly increased the amount of not only confusion, but uh, potential traffic infractions that um, were going on within the area. I know that there are also a lot of apartment complexes um, uh, around uh, the two schools as well, which of course makes sense, but it also makes for a lot of student um, walking areas. And I have uh, plenty of friends who either walk to school or um, uh, end up taking the bus system to school from areas like Tacoma and um, either sometimes some of them like jaywalk across the street and of course I've said hey, don't, don't do that just use the crosswalk but I know um, other students who do in in both scenarios and in cases um, students have nearly gotten into 
um, or I've like been been ran over by cars. I had one particular friend. She was crossing the crosswalk, and a car almost ended up like running her over. And so I feel like it's it, it's not even necessarily even when uh, cars are speeding, the same uh, potential accidents can occur even when they're not. So particular, just a greater social awareness of um, cars as well. But I also know that since Stilicum, um has opened up again, there has been um, more infractions on, on the way to school. I see a lot of um, cars that either swerve kind of between lanes or they don't take notice of the flashing lights at all. And I know that you were saying that there's like an 85% um, chance of like a photo enforcement. And I know that, um, well, I, I personally, I feel, I don't know about other areas that um, the area around Harrison Prep and Lockburn in particular, because it's on two such central roads that connect to different areas of the city together, that that could not only be a hotspot um, for uh, more of those um, infractions to be enforced. But I'm also curious if when you conduct this uh, potential study of, of determining which hotspots are central, what exactly do you plan to do? Do you plan to increase voting enforcement or would you station officers around the area to ensure that um, it's uh, enforced more in person? And um, also because I know that that couldn't be done uh, for all schools, especially as it becomes later in the morning for elementary, middle schools, how do you plan to, um, especially because there are younger students and a lot of them do commute around the communities, how would you essentially just plan to have a greater hold of enforcement and would it be increased or would it stay neutral for areas that, um, or would it even be reduced for areas that aren't necessarily labeled as hotspots? Um, how do you plan to respond to the to maybe that study? So when I was talking about hotspots, we really the, the data set that we have is uh, collision data. Unless we do a uh, like an air tube study where they um, put the air tubes across and measure speed over time. Um, and, and we'll do that when we get you know enough speed complaints in a certain area. Uh, it, what I was talking about it. if we go down the road of installing more cameras, when we decide, go through that process to decide where to put them, we will look at all that data so that we're very deliberate because you have to put in infrastructure that they're not easy to set up and you can't really move them once they're established. So if we do install more cameras, we want to make sure that we put them in the right spots. Um, internally, we we do, our traffic unit does look at the um, <coughs> complaints but the uh, collision data to determine where are the most um, unsafe areas that we <coughs> focus our enforcement on. Um, the problem is right now, we only have two, two officers uh, total to do uh, speed enforcement. So, and they also do, they also do collisions and DUIs. And so um, with all the complaints citywide, hundreds or thousands of miles that we have, you know, they get bounced around to not just the schools, but other, you know, complaints to focus on too. So we try our best to, you know, stick our fingers in the back and respond using data as much as we can. Um, so we do have a deliberate process, we just don't have the resource to be everywhere we need to be. And so I just want to make sure that I'm clear on that. It would be an increase in cameras rather than necessarily enforcement within these um, hotspot areas. <clears throat> If the decision is made to increase the number of cameras, right, we would go through a deliberate process to put them where they would be most effective. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Another question? Well, just another comment, and just like an idea of course back or something. So I'm hearing you too about you get all these, you get a flood of tickets from the truck and you gotta go fill the road. That's time intensive as well. So my thought is, is if we put cameras in, the cameras don't, always necessarily have to be active to really reduce or cause some enforcement there. Because the reality is people know the camera there. They don't know if it's active or not. They have a camera sitting there basically it's active in some periods and not always the other. It's going to cause some reduction in speed there. Some people are going to react to that no matter what. So I thought and that would reduce 
amount of time so we kind of built through and i'm approaching this from a security point of view because that's what i've been doing for 20 years i can put something out there lighting camera system something like that some people will react to that and say okay i think we'll deter crime in some form of fashion and stuff and that's what we're looking for is to reduce the number of speeders in these cases so the camera system yes i'm going to cost money to put in there we're looking at some form of return on investment that return is not necessarily revenue as it is reducing the speed in here yeah, it all it always struck me that if we could just get Google telling the intersection people and then to, to announce that there's a camera here. <laughs> well, again, the camera's out. I pay attention to that, and I don't know whether it's really a camera. I mean, a case of point, have you ever been driving across the country and you come across and you're coming through a town and all of a sudden, you know, the speed reduces, you see a car parked there, a sheriff's car parked there, and you're thinking, is it occupied or is it? <laughs> and so what do you do? You reduce your speed one because the speed reduces. But the other two is if I just kind of go through this little town here and that car is occupied, I'm getting pulled over. So so the reality is that vehicle parked out there, law enforcement vehicle parked there, is creating a reaction to people driving. Can I get a sense of a committee that committee would produce Support increasing the number of school zone cameras. Uh, hey, Ken, would you support increasing the number of school zone cameras? Where is it? Okay. Uh, yeah. Todd, Todd, would you? Thumbs up. I guess I feel like I'm in the mode of needing more data because I'm aware of the contradiction between it being a financial short source and being a, Teresa? a true help. I, I'm, I'm, I have the same thought as Todd. I, 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 I think it's not perfect either way. I, don't, I mean, they don't, people don't respect them now. Are they going to respect them if there's more? I'm not sure. I would have to. I have the same question Todd does, but I, I was curious, and maybe this is already mentioned, it's kind of hard to hear because you guys are in a big echoey room. Um, do you only use the collisions in those intersections or areas as a measure, or I'm sure you also look at how many infractions there are, not just collisions? Is there any rhyme or reason? Um, is there any one particular area that has more infractions? than others? Yeah, so data is hard to come by. Um, collision is really our only hard data that we have, a number of collisions. Um, speed or infractions written is really dependent on the amount of enforcement done. So the more we enforce, the more tickets you're going to have. So that's really a, not a, a hard data point that we can look at. Um, that, I mean, we could look at it, but. Um, and then we would look at, you know, how to do a traffic study. So, um, you know, looking at the number of vehicles, volume of traffic is one data point that we could potentially collect. And then the, the speed tube study will tell us how many cars a day are about, you know, over a certain speed. Uh, but we have to, you know, put a machine out there to, to measure. Okay. But, but for the current school zones with photo enforcement, is that a measurable? Yeah we, yeah, we get a report monthly um, from the camera. So the Red Flex is our contractor that, that runs those. Uh, and it'll tell us how many cars go through and then how many violators we have. Okay. And so you have years of that data? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's it for now then. Yeah. Uh, so Kevin sends us a spreadsheet, the, the command staff, uh, every month. And it has historical data going back to the First installation, like, yeah, 2009 or 10, something like that. So we've got a pretty significant historical data. Okay. But even if you, there was a trend, there's, you don't have the resources to put someone there in that intersection. Right. Is I that, mean, that's correct. We, we would, it would be in our, you know, in our rotation, but 
Um, but yeah, when, like I said, with, with two officers, they pretty much just yeah. from hot spot to hot spot. Yeah. Um, I have a question about officers in schools. I do see, I live near Clover Park and I, I went to Clover Park, so that's my only frame of reference, but I do see an officer at the school. What is the function of that officer in the school and are they there every day? So uh, we don't have officers permanently assigned in the schools. We use okay. an off-duty program. So oh, officers okay. are working for the school district, paid by the school district, um, outside their normal hours of work. Uh, we have one, every day we are scheduled to have one at each high school, and then two additional that uh, each of those has two of the four middle schools. So a total of four officers, and they just cover the middle school and the high schools. Uh, and their function is security and any crimes reported on campus. Okay. A security presence and then any like CPS referrals or allegations of abuse or um, criminal student contact conduct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. If there's any other questions, or shall we move on? No, I'll just make one other comment about school zone safety. Uh, that uh, the city is also looking and looking at getting increasing sidewalks to help people safety. Because the most immediate ones that are scheduled for this year and next is uh, along 112th Street from the Lake Louise Middle School all the far west, which also includes funding. Of broken school, but they didn't have stretch to do that. Uh, and then on along far west to complete the disjointed series of sidewalks from Lakes High School to Pierce College, which is walked by students every day at multiple different times, uh, who are in a mix of running start. So those are the two that are next take out the school sidewalks that we're we'll do. Mark? I don't really have a question, it's more of an observation. Uh, Stillick and Lakewood Drive intersection, when you are traveling south in the right hand lane, that flashing light for the school zone, the first flashing light you get. Is in a kind of a bad location. That has to be a slight curve right there. So you can't see the intersection with the big lights on by the signals there. And that orange flashing light is really visible in right hand lane until you get just about on it. And then all of a sudden, it's there. If somebody local that goes through there all the time knows that the school's on there. But for people that are don't travel that far, all of a sudden they kind of get around that corner and there they are, they're in the school zone. I don't know if that light could be feasibly moved farther to the north or not. Can you repeat one more time which intersection that was or which location that was? Lake, Lakewood Drive and Stillicum as you're going south on Lakewood Drive. So you're coming up the hill to the stoplight at Stillicum. If you're in that right hand lane, there's a bunch of trees there, mm -hmm. and that light is to the, to the uh, west of the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And especially if the, the tree, the wind's blowing a little bit or the boughs are wet, you come up and you don't see that light until you get within like a car length or maybe a couple car lengths of that. Would the solution just be trimming the trees? Oh, I don't know if that, that would work or not, but anyway, it's just. Yeah, it's right, it's right next to the cemetery. If you're in a left lane, it's not quite as bad, but it's, it's worse if you're in the right lane. Weston, did you hear, hear that? Yes, this is Weston here. I did hear that, and I've been taking notes and um, getting an email prepared to send off. Um, and then I have answers to two of the questions that came up earlier when it's appropriate. Okay. 
Could you have answers to a couple of questions? Yeah, one of the questions was how long the lights are on morning and afternoon, and it's uh, 45 minutes. Uh, I did find the school zone light schedule, and I sent that by email to Joanna, so she has that. Um, I, I believe the answer for why Capri, Cabrini doesn't have school zone lights is because 108th is signed as 25 miles an hour in that section of 108th. Um, so what I remember from the past, again, this is a while back, that that's only a five mile an hour drop. So in those situations, the city didn't install school zones where it was 25. Um, but I did check the municipal code and it doesn't list that. It just says this, uh, that uh, red light cameras can be placed in school zones. And I did send the reference for the muni code to uh, Joanna as well, if you guys need that. Thank you. Okay, any, any other questions? I think the consensus of the group was that, yeah, we'd like to see school zone cameras at Priest. Yeah, I just forget if there's anybody opposed to the committee. I, I really want to hear your side too. I don't know if there any, was anybody opposed to it. If you have something, let us know. Speak up and let us hear your side. So. I have light cameras at the school zones. It's a lot more, uh, I think the public will accept that a lot more, a lot easier than red light cameras. I think we've got a lot of anecdotal evidence that people say when I'm driving, I see people driving faster and you hear about it. But I'd like to see something that's an objective number on the other end of some sort, some matrix that says, is are we chasing a problem that isn't there in the sense of impact? Is there a result? Mm -hmm. Or is it just I don't like being a good mindful legal person watching people go by me? If nothing's happening, then I wonder how big a deal is it? Is there is there are there children that I don't know about being run over in crosswalks and people going up the curb or are they taking a sign off the side of the bus? I don't hear about any of this. So John from the commission we share the department of board three six years from that form. Do you want to board in the board? As, as just a, a, yeah, as a point. Yeah, yeah, people can share. Uh, and again, that's it's what we're doing enforcement. Um, so, and our Western Committee explained better, but we have a process of evaluating speed complaints with the, the air tube studies and, and that. I don't know if you want to touch on that, really quick. that would be how we would validate whether that it is a problem. You say, yeah, there's a everyone's violating the school zone. In front of this school, we would validate it with that study. Yeah, so just real quick, the kind of the universal rule of thumb is what they refer to as the 85th percentile speed. So, um, what we look for is when the 85th percentile speed hits 10 miles and 10 miles per hour over the posted speed. So that means 15% of the vehicles are going above um, 10 miles over the posted speed. 85 are from 10 over and down. So that's kind of our, well, not just ours, that's a nationwide, that's kind of the metric uh, used. And what we do is we start with either the pneumatic tubes, like uh, Assistant Chief Umford mentioned, or we do have new signs that are uh, radar feedback signs, but they can collect uh, data. And so we use a combination of that or even a private vendor um, and then we kind of watch that and we'll do a couple of interim steps. And then if it continues to be a problem, then we move again, this is in the neighborhoods to like a phase two approach, which would be a radar feedback sign or maybe a speed table, something of that effect. But again, there, uh, someone had mentioned it early on, there's only so much we can do in the built environment um, to slow slow folks down, but uh, that's our approach. We look at the 80, 10 over, 85th percentile. Did you have another question? I just wanted to mention that Josephine did say that those intersections during the school hours are unsafe and she, she knows people that have almost been hit in those intersections. So regardless of speed limit, 
just being crossing the, the street, she's mentioned that it's unsafe. I just heard someone say, it's hard to say who's saying what, but someone mentioned that they, they didn't hear, they haven't heard, you know, if it's unsafe or a problem or not, but it, it sounds like it is truly unsafe in these environments. Yeah, I know one of the things is that um, school zones and what you do to make them safer is, is, is not one of those things that you want to wait until there's hard data that tells you that the children are getting hurt at a location. So you have to do some things to try to take a look at what, what's probable, not what is actually happening. Uh, and and the probability just isn't the same in every school zone on every street. Uh, I think that the current mix of cameras and the hotspot enforcement thing really does look at where schools are bus busiest arterial because that's where there's the probable combination of a speeding driver and an inattentive young person. The, the one piece of hard data that comes to, to me periodically, and, and I don't know whether it's hard, but maybe it's more anecdotal, uh, comes from school bus drivers. And, and their concern is not in the school zone. Their concern is when they are stopped and they have a sign out that uh, on roads where they expect traffic to not swerve around and pass them by because when they drop off children, some of them are destined for the side of the road where they're getting off, but some are their home is on the other side of the street. And that is there. Uh, and that, that is a concern that is not voiced by school bus drivers in terms of being able to go and do that. But there are, so, so while there is technically a, a violation for passing a stop school bus that's displaying the signs of red lights to be able to go and do that, that's really hard to, to enforce uh, to do that. Uh, and you sort of rely upon the judge that when you are able to to enforce it to say, uh, treat that stiffly. Well, there are buses with, with cameras, so and report that that catch the light. I don't believe that we have any cameras on the school buses that, that are generating enforcement activity. We um, don't. That technology exists. The technology exists now. Yeah. And I have a question, uh, if I may, or maybe just a restatement of what Ray said, which I'm actually interested in also when you're talking about anecdotal evidence and whether or not uh, the data actually shows that, um, because all of us can have opinions about it, but it's still anecdotal, right? And I'm, I'm kind of thinking I heard a little bit about what uh, Councilmember Brandstetter was saying, but still is the data showing it? it and, and that's really the question, I think, if I may say, that Ray was asking. And, uh, and that's what I'm interested in also. Some, somewhere in the cob of my mind, it seems that somebody reported, I think it was Chief Sorrow, that the city or the police department was looking at getting some new uh, radar instant recall oh, yeah, cameras and stuff, or things up and on the road and direction to speak. Is, is that uh, we have, dream that? Or? We have right now a, a radar trailer. Yeah. And we'll we'll put that out based on the complaints. We'll move it around, and it's a, that speed feedback, you know, shows your speed. Um, so we have mm -hmm. one of those. I thought we were. I thought I was thinking that it's being updated or changed or something. I'm not sure. Well, on that. This is Weston here. Um, just to add to that. The radar trailers are quite old, so we've phased them out. So they've been replaced with four portable signs. So the two trailers have been replaced with four portable signs. Oh, I knew I didn't dream it. 
<laughs> yeah, so um, like uh, Mr. Whitcoe ended up saying, and most of the rest of you ended up saying, we really don't want to wait for um, hardcore evidence to show up to be able to implement these. So I was wondering if there might be a different way to acquire similar data um, that, that doesn't necessarily have to involve um, uh, accidents or even fatalities within students. So um, could it be possible to connect with the Clover Park School District a uh, school district to um, issue a survey to students, perhaps from middle school to high school, um, to ask whether or not they had encountered or um, been close to having one of these incidents happen and um, the whether or not it was recent. Um, and that uh, because who better to ask than students themselves who are the most aware and um, who have the, the most attention to their surroundings when um, having to cross the street to um, go to school and um, being able to have that awareness not only for themselves and their peers is also important. And I feel like it would be um, not, well, I feel like it would be a good um, representation, uh, representation of data, even if it's not cold, hard numbers, but being able to see um, and identify this probability and possibility um, and that way we can help defend against the probability from becoming a reality in the future. Could the youth council gather data like that? Um, we do not, but I'm sure that we could talk to the superintendent or a connection with the city to um, easily create a survey and uh, distribute it to students in middle schools and high schools. I know we've had similar um, surveys with like uh, mental health um, and um, uh, different uh, disturbances within home environments. Good data to add to the discussion. Yeah, in the data that we have, we don't have near this data. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about, yeah. That's exciting. Okay, any more? Uh, I have a question. If we purchase those new uh, Speed sign, post on those speed signs, do they have the ability to collect data or are they strictly just direct readout? Uh, they can collect data um, and we're still working with them. We've been using them primarily in our construction zones. Um, that helps uh, slow folks down there as well. But they've been used elsewhere in the city. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted one of those could be put in the school zone, you know, to collect some hard data over you know, some short period of time anyway to give you some indication which one. This construction is always hard. Yeah, but these signs, these the signs are, if you mount them, you can get the data. Yeah, just like, you know, look for that, you can put some of the signs out somewhere else under the construction zone. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Any more discussion on this issue? Thank you, Weston. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is Mr. Branstetter. Uh, well, I think this was a good conversation. And we don't mind. I, I, I would just uh, want to say that the at our last meeting, the city got a, uh, an update on the report about uh, enhancements that are being made to the 911 system from the southbound 911. So, uh, they have moved into a new facility, but they, they, are, they, are, they are moving from the traditional call taking model that has been in place for decades of a you call, you talk to someone. Explain your problem, and you get transferred to a dispatcher who will talk with you, and then we'll, we'll send you the same. A universal thing to where when you call a person that that answers your call is the person that will be with you the entire time and will be doing the dispatch. And that. They're in a process of that transition. So it's a universal call thing. Um, but the other thing is, is that uh, just as personnel concerns about the police are there, there are uh, personnel concerns about 911 call takers and dispatchers. 
South Island one is down 20. Um, so you may see signs on buses and you know, getting notices in the mail and things like that about you know, like to become a dispatcher and, and do that. And it is a starting wage of around $30 an hour for a person who can qualify and it's, uh, is able to do that. So they are updated to that. And then the other, the other thing that we would Got, we, the youth council provided a report to the city council uh, uh, regarding factors and possible courses of action around the status of youth mental health in, 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 in the city and how uh, there are a, you know, you know, a buyer variety of things that are contributing to that and that results have to do with not just in Lakewood, but statewide, suicide rates and, and, and impacts on school performance and, and other things. And while a good number of their recommendations things youth to do and interact with each other as opposed to being isolated and of uh, looking at, at helping with, with the funding of, of programs and of advertising and making youth aware of programs where there is uh, help if you're feeling you need help in our district to do that and uh, we appreciated that. We are going to be looking into what sort of actionable things came from the youth council input and report to us that we appreciate. The other thing at the meeting on Monday was the mayor <clears throat> asked me to ask you. Uh, he would to know if the, this group is willing to spearhead and putting together a survey of businesses within Lakewood of, of, on all of the different business sectors to do that about how do they feel about the, the public safety issues that are impacting businesses? Uh, what, what are the public safety prioritized priorities that they would like to see at address um, and uh, you know, and then that would include what they, what they think is, is going well to be able to go and do that um, looking for uh, another perspective is, is looking to go forth and do it and the mayor thought that if this group wanted to take the lead of doing a survey uh, or however that would be constructed and sort of leaving that to you and maybe in conjunct with the, the, the Chamber of Commerce um, and, and later in the year being able to uh, provide a report back to the council uh, particularly if there are things that look about which things are actionable or what should be the priority of trying to do that from the business perspective. So he asked me to bring that to you to see if you wanted to take that on. So who's interested in taking that would be a couple of questions. Is, is this is there a sustainable instrument who's going to construct it? Uh, as the other funds available to do the project to construct it properly so it's not just do I ask the questions? It's going to be set in the standard so that you can collect measurable data so that you can provide that information back to the city. Okay, I, so I don't come to you saying that there is a, an instrument that the mayor has in mind. The, the city is doing a broad satisfaction community survey every two years and now it, it has some questions in, in it about public safety that sort of don't really address it and that it's not a kind of survey that is 
more targeted at residents than at businesses. That uh, it would be an instrument that would need to be constructed in some decision made about what we want to gather. That the the uh, economic development director, Ms. Newton, and the city communications uh, person would be available resources to help looking at putting that together. Um, that, uh, and because it would be the first time that we had done something like that, the results would end up being a baseline. There really want to provide a timeline by which you would look for that feeling that that would be valuable enough to have it and valuable water to test. Thought that this group would be the best one to, to, to lead that uh, in that effort without being too directive as to exactly how the instrument would work. So, so you're proposing that we would the suggestion is that we would partner with the communications in the city and the city council to well the city economic development director who, who kind of knows who all the businesses okay. they are and, and it is the primary person in the city that talks to business um, and and then uh, the communication guy that we have is sort of he's got some technical and some some insights about how you communicate with the public and how you get them to communicate back to you. Um, I, I I think the city has a preferred survey host that they like to use. So uh, the, 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 the city has but every two years, the city conducts a survey. It's run by it's run by a national company to do that, but it is not targeted at. It's a public think, safety uh, views of businesses. It's, uh, it's 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 much more broad about that. And it's, uh, yeah, I think I I've taken surveys before, and not related to what you're referring to. And it's not, they weren't through SurveyMonkey, they were for, from another site. So I don't know if that's a possibility that we could just use that and it could be distributed through the Chamber of Commerce, but that's not going to, that's not every, that's not gonna be everyone, so. I, I, I think but, if this group was going to take that on, yeah. then strategies are a decision you could make. Okay. Well, I'd be willing to help with this. Um, I am no longer available to help with Summerfest. Um, I will be out of town for a lot of July, um, but I'd love to help with this. I'm interested in, in helping with the survey. Anyone else? Todd. Oh, I, I think <laughs> you, know, have, you have to make sure that it's a blind survey. I think so you can get participation. Also has to be the availability of them being able to make comments. I mean, you can ask specific questions, yes, no, or a one to 10 or whatever. But I think you also need comments. Yeah. And I uh, mean, it, it can be optional to disclose um, the business, but if they, if they want someone to contact them, they would need to disclose that information. Will the, will the city pick up any cost we have for this? You identify some funding. You identify some funding that you need. That's well, I guess less than six digits. We can probably <laughs> do is, is, okay. Is well, the is the outcome of the survey going to be disclosed to? Is it going to be transparent and disclosed per se? So good, bad, or indifferent. 
will be disclosed in that public. I, I would guess to say that the, 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 the raw survey data probably not, uh, but that the reports that you use today that you compile using what you learn uh, would uh, be a public record. Todd, what do you think? I think uh, as uh, many of you probably don't know, I'm current chair and past chair of the Chamber of Commerce and very active in what we do communicating to businesses. Um, can can you turn your volume up a bit? I think I can. Is that louder? That's better. We, uh, we have found the businesses uh, that are chamber members that we've communicated with are very unlikely to answer these kinds of surveys. It's hard to get any data. Um, if the city's mailing list is something that adds a different source of credibility to the incoming survey, I could see it maybe turning out a little more result. Um, I also can tell you between probably five or six businesses around town, we could probably give you what the answers are. <laughs> uh, but uh, well, it is hard to get, it is hard to get the wide results from those. They would have to, it would be wise as it was mentioned for it to be um, uh, raw data that would be disseminated into a uh, meaningful report that was not gonna be divulged just to who'd given what info, I suppose. But I think again, uh, every business manager and owner will give you similar answers and they wouldn't mind anybody knowing. Uh, would you be willing to work on it? I, I would, I'd be willing to help. I, uh, I certainly have some insight as to what's happened in the past. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Interested? <coughs> Todd, please would be interested to work on it, but we need a chairperson to sort of pull it together contact the city chamber of commerce please remember us how is that different from um being just part of the group um that is working on the subject i mean are you talking more of a, a liaison role well to chairing the committee to make the contacts and bring information back to the board what are we going to do? Anybody else? They're all these volunteers. Oh. So this is the something that they want, right? The next time we meet with the council, this is something that we can put in our our calendar and work on our what kind of yeah, the, the mayor did not specify by when he would want to do that kind and, of and, and i and i would think that so so my question was, was the timeline of well when something fruitful would, 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 would take place is is open and, and up to the committee to decide so the, how robust the survey is and, 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 and then when you would want to do it, right? Did tell the mayor that this group does not meet monthly at least every two months. You know, so that they have a thing. It well, take time. Yeah, well, the subcommittee can work on it between our, our meetings, so. So who, who would like to work with Teresa and Todd and put together a concept for what we can do. And if no one, if no one wants to, that's, I mean, two people might be enough. I, I think, yeah. I would help, I just got able to be like a chair, so to speak. Okay. Oh, sure, yeah, I can do that, that's fine. Yeah, you have, you have the time or you'll be running back and forth to Florida. So. Well, we I will I will be in July and then I'll be in South Dakota as well. So, yeah. so but we don't have a timeline, that's what I'm saying. It, it's yeah, it's fine. fine. Yeah, it should be by August. So Teresa uh, you know, I, mean, I think that if, if two months from now you're you're still looking at it, is, is this really feasible for us? Yeah. Yes, the, the mayor does not have a history of shooting messengers, so I can tell him that you're thinking about it. And, uh, and, and, and then you're going to talk about 
again. Okay. Well, we've got police in the car. Mark, you were. I can uh, throw my two cents in uh, a couple of thoughts. You've got the survey design and what information you're going to capture, and then the, the implementation of how you're going to do it. Right. Um, so, those are two kind of pieces. It's sort of uh, envisioning yourself as the, the end user of that. So, if you're surveying businesses and what their priorities and what they want um, is. As much objective info as possible. Uh, the community-wide survey is very, very broad, so it gets you know people's feelings, what they feel about public safety. Do you feel safe, unsafe? That doesn't help me a lot. If I have some hard priorities as a business owner, this is what's important to me. Uh, that's something that we can. You want to collaborate. So with working well with city. Development director and communications, we should be able to nail down information like that and then go to city council or chamber of commerce and start understanding how do we get the businesses to cooperate and give us the information. I do that too. Two processes right. design and and I spoke to Jim Capriza, the communications manager, uh, today, and he knows how to send out mailers and um, and all that. And yeah, we've got databases with you know the um, all the businesses that have licenses in the city, so the city has the data and the know-how to send out surveys targeted to businesses. Um, the one thing Jim mentioned was making sure that we capture the diverse range. Um, a lot of different ethnic businesses and um, stuff. You know, you want to capture everybody. But he could probably help dial that as well. Yeah, well, to Jim's point, the design is going to be critical. We we would communicate that information. Okay, thank you all. Then uh, I guess we'll be in be in touch. I will. Send an email out to three of you and we can start doing something. Okay. I will use the question. Mark, thank you. The Teresa is all on Mark. Okay, anything else? No, we uh, have used a lot of time already today. Okay. Fire Department. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's great to be here. I haven't seen everybody's face other than dining rooms and bedrooms and, and whatnot. So this is this is great. Um, uh, let's see. As far as uh, call volume for February and March, uh, we've been running about 13, 1400 calls. So that's uh, an increase of just about 10 percent, nine and a half, 10 percent over a uh, year prior. Uh, that breakdown works out to be University Place takes up about 300 calls, um, Town of Stillick up about 40 to 45, and then Lakewood is about 1,000 to 1,100 1, per month. So that's just kind of a breakdown. Um, things are opening back up. We're starting to um, participate in more uh, community events and things like that. The city has a, a whole slew of events and um, town stuff as far as uh, Summerfest. Uh, I know I think in May, some of the uh, farmer's markets are gonna be starting back up. So we're excited to participate in that. We've got some safe sitter classes and surf classes. So uh, if you know anybody in your neighborhood,
It was, yeah, it was kind of kind of chopped up a little bit, um, but yeah, still either way, it's sad to see some of those uh, boats in there that uh, he was working on. There's some really old Chris Craft kind of stuff too. Mm -hmm. In there, so. Any early indication of what started? No, they, they're working on a number of theories and uh, still trying to gather some witness statements and things like that. I mean, it was it was ribbon pretty good uh, when the crews got there. I mean, there's there's some homeless activity out there, so they're they're still gathering information, seeing if there's uh, any video that they can use uh, to try to find out where where it started, kind of pinned down. So. Still working on that. Um, the cities uh, and uh, the fire department uh, are part of an emergency management coalition. Uh, I'm not sure if John will talk a little bit about that. We're kind of in the middle of some training. We had one in uh, March. We have another one, I think, set up for the 21st, I think. Um, that'll lead up to a bigger event uh, with the cities. Uh, that is called Cascadia Rising, which is kind of cool because it's going to focus on a big event that happened and i think john correct me if i'm wrong it's the second 24-hour period um some along those lines yeah it's uh i think it's plus 48 hours they're, they're starting uh, it's actually a, a region multi-state um, in response to the large cascade earthquake so they did an exercise we did one three years ago and then now it's the follow-up so yeah, the, the initial one was the initial response, and then this exercise will be more of just that transition to recovery. And that will be in June. So we're going to train uh, leading up to that. Uh, let's see, we have a youth academy coming up. We haven't done that in the last couple of years. Um, the youth academy, it's in late June, and we have a team that's going around to the high schools. Uh, engaging 11th and 12th graders. Uh, I'm not sure how much we're able to get in front of all the students, but at least the schools know to be able to pass on information. So if people are interested in fire service, we do a two day program where um, we run them through a number of different activities. And that's not just, okay, put some bunker gear, gear on, carry some hose, squirt some water. It's they have some EMS stations. They have another station where they can work on resumes, interview practices, and things like that. So it's not just geared all towards fire. So um, that's a two-day period. Um, we're opening up applications May 2nd through the 13th. And that's on our website. And the high schools all have that information, too. So we're excited to be able to offer that again. Uh, <clears throat> If you get on our website, um, we also have a facilities maintenance technician that we're hiring for. So if you know anybody that's interested and does maintenance work or facility work, um, we have an opening for that. Uh, that's going to close in a week. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we also have our annual report that's all complete too. And you can uh, access that on our website uh, for a download and you can view uh, our annual report. That's about it. Um, any questions? What resources are type are you are you likely doing with first aid or any similar training? You can be able to get those stations. Yeah, uh, probably uh, CPR classes will probably start up in July uh, again, um, and then we are offering uh, a cert class uh, in June, and we have actually kind of a little bit of a backlog with those cert classes. Uh, but we're going to be probably doing hopefully two or three through the end of the year with those sort of classes. And then CPR classes, probably hopefully monthly, but maybe every other month, just depending upon demand. Uh, so excited to be able to get back and offer those again. So it's been a, it's been a while. So. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Oh, you're on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, uh, our annual report is also out um, and just uh, was presented to council a week or two ago, so we haven't really distributed it until uh, we presented it to council, but it is out on the website. I think Joanne sent the link just a little bit ago. Um, and just a couple of highlights from that. You can look at it and we'll go more in depth. I know we kind of run late uh, tonight, but 
crime is up uh, across the board, all, all categories, about 8%. Um, still well below where we were, you know, when the department started. Uh, but a couple of reasons, uh, really it's uh, COVID and the inability to book people in the jail. Uh, that is slowly loosening up as COVID fades off, I guess. Uh, but we are starting to be able to book a few more people in. Um, of course, there's also a, a backlog in the courts because they were you know, shut down and limited during COVID. So they are starting to catch back up. Uh, and then some of the legislative changes uh, have really impacted. And primarily we're seeing that with stolen vehicles. Um, so the numbers for stolen vehicles are through the roof. Uh, more than double, um, and uh, that's definitely high. Uh, and then just a uh, sort of the random violent crime uh, hasn't impacted us as much as the county in Tacoma, but uh, I guess it's been up as well. Uh, hiring, so we are technically we are one over our uh, allotment. We've been authorized to hire ten over to give us a cushion for all the retirement and so on for the case. You know, so long to get an officer trained and so on. Uh, so we're one over. Uh, we've got nine in the academy right now, uh, one by himself, and then a group of eight. Uh, and then we've got four conditional offers out uh, for two laterals and two new hires in addition. Uh, the downside is that those you know people will not fill a spot until about August, September, uh, by the time they get out of the academy and do their on the job there. Laterals are quicker, but um, so right now our NPO unit, traffic unit, uh, property crimes unit, and special ops unit are very minimal. Uh, but hopefully by the end of the year they will be back up to the full strength. But in this case, what's an NPO unit? Uh, neighborhood police officer. Uh, so we, uh, but the good news is we just did another test. We had 68 applicants. Um, so we're getting good numbers of applicants and compared to other departments, we're doing very well in our hiring. Um, home is way down, sheriff's department is way down. They can't get the applicants when we are. So um, I think a lot of that is the, the reputation and the support that we get. Uh, is there any possibility that the city council will increase the size of the department? Uh, I don't think that's been talked about. Uh, maybe with the new census data, I think we added that at four, four five thousand people to the city. But uh, for now, we're we're trying to get to back to our full staff. So we'll, we'll look at a lot more there. That's above my pay grade. Right? Uh, and then lastly, uh, we're in a pilot program or pilot phase uh, of body camps. You know, so I've been wearing line today uh, and I'll actually pass it around. So um, that's, the, that's the camera. And uh, so we have 16 officers, um, not counting uh, the command staff. Um, several of us are, are wearing them. And so we're, we have a draft policy and we're working through the technical glitches as well as the policy. Because as you can imagine, it gets a little bit dicey on when do you activate the camera and when don't you? Because there's a lot of privacy concerns. You activate in somebody's home, their body you go to the doctor's office or the emergency room. And, you know, so we've got to work through all of those issues. Um, and that's what we're doing. So we've got a trial. Um, and then eventually we will roll it out to the entire um, department. So uh, uniformed officers will have their own and then there'll be a pool for detectives and investigators. They will only use those when they go out in the field to do contacts, interviews, arrests, that kind of thing. Um, for the patrol officers, they have a dock in their vehicle and they also have the in-car video. So all of our markings have the in-car video in the vehicles. Um, this will take over as the microphone, but so each officer, officer has the camera in the vehicle and the body cam. When they are done with an incident, they take the body cam, stick them in a dock in the vehicle. It downloads into the vehicle and then when the vehicle hits one of our designated Wi-Fi spots, like here at the station, it automatically uploads both of those videos. Um, the officer tags it with the case number, and then they, they get uploaded. Um, and then there's other ways, too, that you can come into the station and, and doctor the body cam and it uploads and so on. So um, we'll be one of the only departments around that has both body cams and uh, the car video. So. Good afternoon.
to manually add case numbers. Right. So that means they have to redo the entire video. No, no, no. So when they when they get done <clears throat> with the call, they go into the system, they just enter the case number, and then when the video uploads, it's saved under that case number so that we can find it again. Okay. So the call is automatically assigned a case number. So the call is and then the next case, the next thing call we go on is a whole new recording. Right. So you have to log the, the case number. So the case number comes comes from our computer aided dispatch, uh, which is in the officer's computer. And at some point, maybe we can get them to talk to us two different vendors. So that's that's going to be down the road. So for now, they have to you know manually enter that in. But, um, but anyways, uh, so we have all the cameras working through the, the technical glitches, and then uh, hopefully by the end of the year, that will be fully rolled out. But we're still in the pilot phase. So. Teresa, did you have a question on cameras? Oh, no, it wasn't on cameras. It was on hiring. I was wondering if you had the, um, I know it was a priority to hire minorities. I was wondering if you had that information. I don't off the top of my head. Okay. For you. I was going to say, I can, I can testify to the fact that the women's restroom is full. Like okay. <laughs> it's kind of exciting. I know, weird, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm trying to count off the top of my head. Um, because it's not a hard data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of us. <laughs> I think at least four women are in that group. Okay. I think last time it was two. And I guess now I ask this question every time. So maybe next meeting you could have that information. I can get it out by email. Cool. Thank you. So. Were there any Hispanic or Spanish speaking officers in that group? Uh, I'm not sure. But the Los Angeles is kind of an observer. Uh, no, we've got several others uh, yeah. David, David Mullen, and Michelle, okay. and Jason Catlett. Uh, and, and we have Austin for the Korean for Korean. Mm -hmm. We have a few other languages. Yeah. Uh, we did lose our one sign language uh, person. He retired from Texas Bowl. Uh, Linda oh, sure. was in the Texas Bowl games. Quarter before. What's that? Linda and me included in this. Oh, I can, I can send you an email. Well, how are you going to replace sign language? That's part of that's kind of part of the Yeah. Um, the language bank, I believe, has the capacity of dealing with my video. Um, I'm trying to think, somebody just had a case where they had to do that uh, and use essentially Zoom mm -hmm. or FaceTime to, to communicate. So the technology is there. What is the officer's reaction to the, are they encouraged by the body cams? Yeah, um, they actually um, have grown in popularity uh, a lot. When we first did the in-car video, I think there, there was some hesitation. And literally the first shift that it was out there, um, the officer got a complaint and we were able to pull up on a video uh, and that made some believers. Uh, with everything else going on recently, um, and actually in the county, they, um, they've, they've had a couple of officer involved shootings that have um, been dramatic, the investigation has been dramatically shortened because everything was on the body cam. Um, there was one in the county where the, op the deputies fired, but the suspect ended up shooting himself. Um, and so they were able to clear and realize that it wasn't even an officer called shooting just off of the body cam. Um, so the officers were very much in favor of uh, the body cams. It's, I mean, it's another, you know, Piece of gadget you got to turn on and, and dock and, and do all that. So, you know, that adds to the, the workload a little bit. But yeah, they're, they're very much very good. Any other questions? Yeah, anybody have any more questions for Sean? Okay, I'll see you soon tonight. No. That's, that's not right. I thought you were probably grooming, so you. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, you council comments. What's been you have any comments for us? Um, just to kind of notify you all on some basic basic things that um, the youth council is planning. So I know that um, Mr. Brandsteiner already ended up announcing that um, we were going to be having a youth um, summit. But to go more into depth on that, uh, we'll be covering um, some different topics of concern uh, that um, you guys have already been talking about, such as mental health. Um, and we've also been looking at uh, how to ensure that students are financially um, uh, aware and educated. So uh, we'll be getting some help from, let me double check on the bank, um, but uh, we're really trying to focus on financial uh, literacy um, among students and um, ensuring that they're doing well. So we'll have breakout sessions um, during our summit, uh, focusing on those. And then we have one of our very own um, teachers from Clover Park High School to uh, as one of our guest speakers and um, among the uh, community, they're very well known for their positivity. So they'll be speaking there. Um, but just some more general concerns um, or actually one point I did wanna say was that um, I attend Harrison Prep and uh, Oh, recently, there have been a lot of um, stations from um, the police department and the fire department and the like, and um, there was a lot of people who were interested in the information they had to offer. So I know a lot of students were really appreciative of um, you all coming out to give more information on that. And even if they weren't necessarily planning on entering the field, it was still an interesting opportunity to engage with you all. So we were all very appreciative of that. And then um, just as I was kind of saying before that a lot of students have um, kind of uh, perhaps seen a rise on the potential street accidents or incidents that occur. Um, and then as well as students who drive, I've had, um, I believe it's in the last two months, I've had two friends whose cars have been broken into. And for one person, um, granted they had a lot of stuff in their car so I could, even though it's unfair, I can understand why um, it may have happened, but out of everything that was in the card, the only thing that was stolen was their vaccine card. Um, so not even necessarily like um, money or anything, their money was still intact. Um, and so maybe also to be looking at the rate of crime that may occur um, due to um, COVID not necessarily as like a byproduct, but as a direct result of it and the kind of motivations um, behind that, like vaccine cards to be able to access different places and how that may play a role in more general crimes. Um, but I don't believe we really have anything else to add. Do any of you guys have any questions for the youth council or um, different ideas or concepts that you would like me to relay back to either the count the youth council or schools in general? Good question. Good to have youth council back on back in action. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for letting me join. Thank you. Okay, um, unfinished business. Uh, we have two. We have one thing that didn't make the agenda is last two months ago we had Mary Dodsworth speak to us <clears throat> on the parks. And if anyone has any suggestions, because we haven't thought about it now for a couple of months on park safety improving park safety. Would you send them to Joanna to be distributed to the whole group? So we covered that issue and the uh, anything that occurred to you that was think about the presentation we we just get it recorded. We can talk about it. Okay, then uh, update on the dump tank mark Oh, great. I think I'm going to commit to as uh, soon as I said I'm going to take it. So um, I can speak a little bit more. 
I got it all worked out. I think James is, I followed his trail, he followed my trail. Anyway, North Fork has three things. The reservation is completely placed no further ahead than 30 days. Uh, now they're getting kind of rigorous on making sure that you come with a rig that can pull up and that you've got safety stuff. So I'll have to go a little early. They can shake the chains and look at the platform and I'll dress nice so we can get a good representation. <laughs> and then they give you a 10 minute uh, that you forget pretty quick how I want you to deploy it to get all the parts to, to come out and then how to get it back. So I, that's all taken care of. The deposit's 100 bucks if you want to pick up. And I, I don't know where all went to about how to fund that, but Mark and I, I mean, it's been a bunch of us that would just pay it. It's our donations. So if I go, I'll, I'll pay it. Um, the coordination that needs to be done ahead of time, and the one that sometimes is a challenge, um, this department, our department, volunteers that like to get wet on that day. So it, in the past, there was some spotty stuff where people thought somebody was coming and then they fell short. We almost recruited participants to get up on the seat. Some of them did so joyously, so we worry about them. But if that kind of volunteer solicitation, maybe not too early, but not too late, takes place. Uh, the other is, uh, I was on this committee before a year and a half ago for six years. So I did it a couple times in, and it seemed like where we needed to go to leave the trailer, connect with the water source, fire, and coordinate the time was moving around a little. So I, I hope to work that out early. And I think at least the last time I did it, we settled on a good, yeah, we didn't know to settle for a drainage field the first couple of times. Right. So when you empty the tank, you know, there's a small flood throughout in the Swally. So we, we found a couple of places that were suitable, co-located with usually where the fire and police set up. So I'll just make sure I, and I'll check with you to see who I should connect with a, a little ahead and make sure we're all at the same place at the same time. I'll, I'll be out there in the morning because I think the city's doing a, they're doing like a little small pool. They're doing skimboard or something like that. I, they, they have another event out there where they need like another 800 gallons of water or something. So. Okay. Well, there's a, there's an after action report that was done in 2017, which is the last time we've been there. And then Joanna's got a copy of the And I've got copies here for our team so we can look over and talk everything that it is. And, and is there a rubber ducky for Ice Chief? We have a big one for you, Alan. I brought my own last time. Alan, your name is at the head of your volunteer for the you still have it? No, I was just thinking about it. I'm going to have to go buy another one. That's a nice flamingo uh, floating that I use. Okay. What, when you're a Are you a lot of that mean you're volunteering? Yes. One year it's really hot. Volunteers are pretty easy to get, whether they're just people walking yeah. around or. <laughs> and then amongst ourselves, we'll have to divide up a little bit of the worst load. You know, who's going to make contact with the, the pitchers and get some breaks so people can move around. So other people on the. Yeah. We're need somebody to spend the money box. Two hour shifts. We can do that yes. uh, a little bit closer to time. I will say I turned in the application and I have been um, talking um, with Sally, repeatedly reiterating the need to be where we can easily um, release the water when we're done, we can have some tweenies so that they can fill us and we'll whisk our donkeys. So they're very aware of what we need. And she did reiterate, you know, mm -hmm. she was asking me how long it takes to fill the tank. Uh, I don't know. Great, right? okay. yeah. I didn't think it was more than half. I said I wouldn't think more than half an hour. Right? Oh, no. You know? No. Yeah. No, so there's, there's items out there. Yeah. Yeah. And she asked how you're filling up with like the closest hydrant. <laughs> it's just like I don't know. You spray right. more than filling it up. Five hundred gallons on there, but okay. we need to flush it out. Make okay. sure it's at least clear water because I know that dunk tank by midday gets kind of milky looking. Uh -huh. You yeah. know, so. Yeah, we'll try to make it. There's always been a lot of speculation about where you get the water. <laughs> so I'm likely to pick that up and park it in front of my home the night before and go early. So I don't get tied up in many complications of coming across the grass. And the last time, and I'll look at this after action, the last time that the press part of the terrain there 
is right outside that. What do they call the new building? The pavilion. The pavilion. The pavilion. Yeah. So that's where it was the last time. And this is not too long. So I'm just going to go to the Okay. So I'll get there early. Um, he's the president of my homeowner association, so I will have his tacit approval to get down make the driveway. <laughs> More right to it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I have, sorry, I have one more thing about that. So um, in all of our discussions back and forth about the, the uh, Lakewood police officers charity getting all the proceeds and all the donkeys and it finally occurred to me to ask the fire department who has helped man this stunt take every year that we've had it um if they had a charity as well okay. well and behold they do chief Darrow suggested that we we split it in case of fire particularly if we get to firemen and, uh, and i suppose it's fair I didn't know if you guys wanted to hear about I, I did ask Scott, Scott if you'd be willing to tell you guys what theirs is because you know what ours is. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you had one, so he said I wasn't the only one. Yeah, and, and, uh, and I could, we have a, a slide presentation we could do too, but it's, it's a 501c3. Mm -hmm. we've, had, we've had it since like 1992. Um, the big piece of it, it's funded primarily uh, from in-house employees. So we've got, you know, 180 employees. So we do um, probably a good $600 a month in donations. Um, so it's not a big budget. We do have some civic groups that will uh, donate to us. Our big programs, um, the biggest is when people get burned out of their homes, they don't have a lot of resources. And you can imagine who those folks are. Some of them don't have renter's insurance, some of them don't have good citizenship paperwork, they can't get a lot of the grants that are sometimes available through the city. And really, so all we're trying to do is trying to bridge that gap so they can get resources from family. So it's just, it's maybe a couple home, uh, hotel night stays if uh, Red Cross can't reach in, it's food, it's clothing, things like that. Um, some of uh, Caring for Kids does a back to school, a uh, couple of programs that they do during the summer. And what we do is we set up and donate a good three to 400 uh, bike helmets uh, there. It goes on and on. Uh, one of the other programs that we do is one of the Civic uh, Liquid Rotary is helping us fund an AEB program. And so if anyone in the room knows of any public spaces where we can help uh buy and donate uh, an AED we'll do that and we've done that through the city of Lakewood we've done one out of Fort Stillwood Park so yeah it's, it's neat it's good okay uh new business oh, sorry my bad as well uh Mark informed me that I left off another thing under unfinished business which was uh we said that we would Come back, circle back around to the fireworks ordinance issue. Oh, so that's that was my fault. Yeah, education for the fireworks, and uh, I think Chief Zaro was going to work with us. On it. So I guess maybe we might table it for the state table it, and uh -huh. <laughs> I'll ask Chief Zaro what about that. And if I could just mention just a little bit. So I do have a meeting with Chief and uh, Jim Capriva and Jenny Weeks, our communications manager. We have a meeting set up to talk about fireworks on May 4th. Yes. So I mean, it's just, so you may have more yeah. information, but yeah. we're okay. talking about what we can do to uh, Great. talk about what we can do in the community. Okay. Yeah, yeah we're right at 90 days. You know, yeah. We're going to get the I think the committee kind of volunteered to help and have education too. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you. So we'll bring it up again next meeting. Okay, new business. Uh, next next meeting, we're going to have the trash one public works speaker on the trash, and we'll have a progress report on what we're doing on the survey of business grant better to account for us to do anything else anybody would like to add to the next meeting? 
Hmm? I'll write down fireworks. So I don't oh, okay. Fireworks. Oh, yeah, that's on the page. And were you going to uh, consolidate whether you had any feedback from the staff? Oh, yeah. you asked yeah. folks to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any outreach reports? Uh, North Lakewood Neighborhood Association. Uh, they're still working on meeting in person. Uh, they're working on that. But, uh, we had uh, Sergeant Devaney uh, made a report basically on what we heard here about the fleet landing and uh, where the increase in activities was at. Did it from his police car? So it's uh, you don't call it police car, okay? Shop SUVs now. SUVs, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, that, that's that's uh, and uh, Woodbrook uh, is not uh, the last thing that we did. We posted on Facebook on the twenty first of February, but they haven't had any. There's still no meetings of the visitor. So they haven't had any that. Yeah, Springbrook seems to be. Not meeting very much. Uh, we're still pushing uh, food donations. And also, I heard a rumbling, and one of their people was going to attend tonight at uh, the house. Uh, some other issues that they had, I would say, it's not involving police and fire, but some other safety issues they had. And so the person did show up, I guess. Okay. Anything else? I thought the citizens coffee was really good on safety. I was it kind was. of surprised that there wasn't more comments from the public on concerns. Yeah, it was very good. Yeah. Good, very good piece of dinner. Yeah. We'll see what happens in two months on only. Oh, well, there's a question I can ask. If uh, there is a concern about a homeless camp. Do we follow police department or who do we call somebody in the city? You can use the My Lakewood 311. Oh, use My Lakewood. Awesome. Just take a picture. Yeah, you can take a picture um, and it'll geotag it or you can just enter in the location. You get on the website, you can download the app so you can get a picture. So, any other, any other comments from our distant audience on Zoom? Is, is this Ms. Kaiser's last meeting since we're not meeting again till June, or are you staying with us for the summer? Um, I believe that, uh, to be honest, I, I don't know. Um, but if you would like me to still engage throughout the summer, I would be willing to do that. Well, I, I think, you know, you certainly are contributors this evening and you appreciate that and i know the youth council sort of goes on hiatus uh <laughs> when, 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 in june uh for a while but some you know we, we do have meetings in june and in august that would uh, yes yeah, so um i it, it's my senior year so if that were to be true this would be the only meeting i would be able to attend um but i also know as if um you guys go about kind of looking at um different student um or um things that may affect students i would be more than willing to continue to contribute especially as we go into the next school year and if it's something um, where even when I go to college, you guys would still like me to participate or look at the um, uh, look at the community in in terms of a college lens, I would be willing to participate then as well. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I'm wearing my guard from development eight years ago when I. Uh, Previous police chief, previous, previous city manager, I said, you know, I'm looking for places to get information. You guys want me to be a conduit from the public and you hear from when I got problems, but I was trying to find community activities where I go and say, 
I'm on the PSAC and tell them what it is. I'd really like to be an information bearer for you or answer questions that may be within my scope, blah, blah, blah. But I realized I would just like to bet anybody else who wanted to pretend something. So it took about a year. Got this logo approved. Got a couple of garments done. So, and Chief Farrar actually got his ID cards. He kind of put a smack on me when he issued mine because he says, here it is. It says that you remember, it does not give you the rights of arrest or carry a firearm. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I bring this up only because I've mentioned it a few times. I was going to send Joanna some photos, but I put it on now. I still think since we're coming out of the dark ages and virus is going to be a constant part of our day at a lower level as we go out and meet people. And there's a lot of people wanting to, to get in your pocket, your wallet, invite you to participate in stuff. Something to legitimize you can help. And they may even see it and they become familiar. But I was impressed how long it took the city to decide that this you know, especially complicated logo was within the color scheme, the size, and content. So that works been done. Uh, I think the embroidery company that did this is still in business and they put it on a, a file and I'm not soliciting anything. I'm going to try to use it to not look like I'm just some hand hand work. So I just, I brought it. I guess they can't see it. We'll do a private showing. You guys want to know, I'll send you pictures. <laughs> <laughs> but you can get put on any garment that's, that the city allows. Anything else? I'll hear a motion for a term. So moved. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. To adjourn. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for attending. Yeah. 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 Yeah.